Here's the question that I'm struggling with. Which is worse? Is it worse to have a foreign government trying to meddle in our elections? Or is it worse to have our own government meddling in the election? Because that's, I think, exactly what this report shows. It shows that our government, the most powerful law enforcement agency in the nation, the FBI, effectively meddled in an ongoing presidential campaign. And the thing that gets me is you expect it from foreign governments. I'm not saying it's good, but I'm saying that you expect it. They've been doing it for years. Russia's been doing it for years. We know they tried to do it this last cycle. China has been doing it. Others have been doing it. And we know what steps to take. We've got to take them more effectively. But when our own government does it, how can the American people have confidence? And what do we do? I mean, what do we do? And there's one actor here, I think, who has not gotten the credit that they collectively deserve, and that's the Democrat National Committee. I just think, you know, I've heard my friends on the other side of the aisle complain about Hillary Clinton's campaign and how ineffective it was and how the DNC didn't do a good job in 2016. I beg to differ. This is the most incredible. The DNC pays for the Steele dossier, solicits the Steele dossier, and then gets the Federal Bureau of Investigation to go get FISA warrants, surveil an American citizen, surveil a presidential campaign, all on the basis of this manufactured garbage that they paid for. I mean, that's extraordinary. I think uh, Hawley makes a good point there, everybody. I also think that we forget, even if the the uh, deep state conspiracy did not manage to destroy the Trump presidency. It has been a massive hindrance to it. It has slowed it down. It has bogged it down in the uh, nonsense of the process of the Mueller probe and everything else. Um, and it's almost like people don't realize the country is at a time of relative peace and booming prosperity. Uh, let's get to our friend David Harsanyi. He's got a piece up on National Review. The Obama administration's FISA abuse is a massive scandal. David, great to have you back. Always a pleasure. Thank you. All right, man. I mean, I, I have had people, I spoke to an unnamed Democrat who goes on TV a lot at Fox, who's basically like, yeah, it's not really that, you know, some mistakes were made, not a big deal. And I look at people now who say this, and there are a lot who I think for professional reasons are just, they're just pretending that reality isn't what it is. Um, but give me your case for why, I mean, you and I agree on this. This is a huge deal. <laughs> this is not a small deal. Yeah, I mean, the reality is that, uh, that, Democrats don't have to worry very much because the press is not going to treat it as the massive scandal it is. I mean, if if we, if I hate to even frame it this way, but it is really no better way to do it. If if George Bush had used the FBI in this kind of way to spy on the Obama campaign, it would it would be the biggest story of the of the century. It would the, Washington would have melted down. The, you know, you you it, I mean. You have a dossier that's made that's completely just fabricated stuff. Some of it may be coming from foreign, uh, you know, intel from foreign sources. Disinformation. Let's just say it's disinformation. Right. right. You use that. It's the essential ingredient for you to get warrants from a court that already gives warrants to 99.8% of people who ask. Do you know what I'm saying? You're lying to a court that will basically give anyone a warrant who wants one. Good point. What does that tell you? And then... Um, you know, you open this investigation, which it seems to me that it's very easy to do. Low, uh, I forgot, uh, I forgot what the terminology was, but anyway, you. Inv- but to propel it, you need to continue to lie, and I, you know, I can't even believe people aren't calling for an investigation. This is just a massive deal, and I'm I mean, saying- just can I just add, David? I mean, you're talking yeah. about the low, the low predicate for opening the investigation. Right. I told again one of these Democrats I talked to over at Fox the other day. By the FBI standards, and I was telling her this, and I was serious, I could open a FISA on you, speaking to her. I mean, I could open a FISA on anyone. Right. And then, you know, they, they pretend that, that there was some high threshold to get this thing moving. But if that had been the case, they wouldn't have needed the dossier. They wouldn't have fabricated evidence is what they did. It changed emails. Uh, what could possibly, you know, but I asked this at the top of the show, what could possibly be the justification for that? I mean, you're an FBI guy. These are all handpicked people by McCabe. We've already had that testified to by the IG. How could anyone looking at this, understanding that they are playing with the most politically fissile material imaginable here within the FBI, right. and you're going to fabric, you're going to lie about evidence in writing? Well, people tell me, I mean, I saw someone who used to be like a libertarian type, you know, who used to be very concerned about FISA warrants and, and metadata and all that stuff, saying, ah, you know, definitely the FBI sort of screwed up here. <laughs> 17 times they screwed up in the skewing in the same direction in the same case. Now, obviously, you have prosecutors sometimes who, who do what they, you know, have to do, unfortunately, to, 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 to push a case. 
But you're talking about uh, one administration, which runs the DOJ and the FBI, spy, you know, it's an independent uh, organ, but it's still under, in that administration, spying on the other opposing party in a, in a Democratic during an election. I mean, I don't know. I, I just, I, I think it's, it's a huge scandal. And, and uh, you know, the way the media treats it, and they have really no choice because they can't back away. They, it's so many of them said this was nothing that for them now to turn around and make it into a big deal, they can't even do it if they wanted to. What do you think the tone is like? I mean, I used to sit around and, and hear them at CNN and the different editorial meetings talking about things sometimes. What do you think places like that, uh, are, are they just complete, p- completely bereft of any introspection over their role in all of this? You know, I mean, does does my does my favorite over there, Jake Tapper, still think that he's a really honest and serious journalist with no axe to grind against anybody? I mean, how does this how does this actually continue on? Well, I mean, obviously, we both know people can fool themselves into believing things, especially when it comes to politics, and it becomes tribal. And I think CNN. You know, not particularly anyone there, but just in general, that channel has positioned itself as sort of the anti-Trump for them to turn around now and help Trump to 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 talk about this story in a, in a real in an honest way is just not going to happen. So uh, everything probably just remains the way it is. But the the excuses that they've given, and and when you go back and read these stories about the Devin Nunes uh, memo and all of the mockery that went on, when, meanwhile he was right about everything. Uh, pertaining to the to pertaining to the FISA warrants. Yeah, and there were, I mean, weren't there members of Congress who were saying that he needs to step down. He can't be the uh, you know he can't be on the on the intelligence committee anymore. He's a, they say this about everybody. They say people are Trump stooges, and that so called Trump stooges, it turns out, are correct. Right. I mean, I th- I don't remember how this went, but I, I went back and I was proud of myself for writing that we should just li- at least listen to the memo before we just dismiss this guy because it seems plausible what he's saying, but. Uh, you know, this is when I still believe that, uh, you know, there were straight reporters doing good work in, you know, places like the Washington Post sometimes. But anyway. Um, they Wait, do you think that's not the case though. anymore about yeah. this stuff? Oh, about this stuff. I was going to actually write something about this. I mean, I can't even open that newspaper and believe anything anymore. And I'm not saying that to be a, a, like, you know, a re- you know, kind of a jerk about them. I'm, I don't know that I can believe what they're reporting about the presidency or the White House in any way anymore, because two years from now it might turn out to be false. So sometimes I'm actually upset at Trump, and I'm like, wait a minute, this might not even be true at all. And that's, I think, how a lot of people feel about the media. So and It feels to me like there's absolutely no accountability whatsoever for the people that got this incredibly wrong the whole time. I mean, these so-called... Did, they run a corre- did anyone run a correction? Did anyone None. take back a story? The BuzzFeed has a giant story about that that swears that the, the parts of the, uh, the dossier are true and so forth and so on. No, no correction. Nothing. They just move forward like nothing, nothing happened. I also think it's noteworthy that none of the journalists seem to have any, I mean, maybe this would be happening behind closed doors, but you haven't heard about any blowback that a lot of these journalists, assuming they were not, and I'll, I mean, I, I think I'll give them this, I don't think they were entirely fabricating their government sources because they just put them on the payroll. You know, they put Clapper and Brennan and these people on the payroll, so it's not like it's hard for them to find, you know, a, a high-level government source to speak to them about these things, but their sources had to be lying to them. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, we knew this in the middle of, you know, at the beginning, because you had, like, CNN reporters and Washington Post reporters uh, peddling things that turned out to be untrue very quickly, we learned, and yet clearly they were going back to the same sources. I forget which reporter it was, uh, one of the reporters, I think it might be a CNN reporter, had supposedly two sources telling him something completely wrong, the same exact wrong thing. It was about... uh, about an email, I forget exactly what it was about, but clearly, you know, they don't blow their sources after they get screwed like that. I mean, it's it's crazy. You have no reason to protect sources that undermine you in that way, and uh, they just kept going back to them. Guys, we're going to come back and talk to David in a second about uh, Times Person of the Year and also this uh, Trump policy meant to protect the Jewish community in this country. We'll be right back. All right, we're back with our friend uh, David Harsanyi here. And I I just, David, uh, the president, look, I think the president's tweets sometimes are, sometimes I'm not a fan, but sometimes they're amazing. And he he tweeted out this morning about, uh, about Greta, I'm trying to find the exact verbiage here, but he tweeted out about Greta uh, Thunberg that uh, she basically needs to, she needs to chill 
and go like hang out with some friends and see a movie. You have written on the Greta Thunberg thing, and I just note that even people that I think are sometimes somewhat reasonable about uh, in the media, they buy into this. Oh, you can't. Crit- you you basically can't say anything about Greta Thunberg, or else people jump down your throat and say you're a bad person who's who's bashing kids. What do you say about this situation? Well, I mean, uh, you know, it's my colleague Charles Cook put it well when he said that you can't be both the shield and the sword, meaning, you know, you can't use this person to, you know, smite all the terrible people and and then stand behind her and not allow anyone to react to it. So I think there's a, you know, there's a way to talk about children who are used by, 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 the, by the way. I mean, I think her parents and the producers and UN officials and all the people who give her money, they are abusing this child. That's what I think. I don't blame her. So I think the way you talk about it is you don't mock her, but you mock her ridiculous ideas because she's a ridiculous uh, person, not the girl, just the idea of her. You know, she's just mimicking things that other people have told her. So, um, I mean, to make her person of the year, she has literally done, you know, I went through all the persons of the year going back to the 20s or whenever it started. And I have to say, you know, I have to admit that Time actually did a very good job in, mostly in, in, in picking people that actually sort of molded the 20th century, you know, and it's just really kind of impressive in a way to look at it. Uh, and then you have this. It just shows how unserious the media is and how unserious many of us are about the world these days. It's just a, it's a clown show. I mean, here's, here CNN has their headline about this this morning is Trump again mocks teen climate activist Greta Thunberg. I mean, I really... Uh, I, I really got to say that uh, to any adult who listens to this girl, I think it's fair to question certainly their judgment and maybe their intelligence. Well, I mean, they tell us I have to, t- you know, they keep saying take her seriously. So when I do take her seriously and I write about the idiotic things she says, you know, I am, you know, I get attacked for being triggered by a girl. I mean, you cannot have it both ways. Same thing goes for that uh, David Hogg or whatever his name. I don't know how to pronounce it. Yeah, they tried name. the same thing with him. I remember that. Yeah. So he's allowed to, to basically call gun owners terrorists and murderers, but no one is allowed to react to this sort of thing. It's just ridiculous. Uh, and her, her being on the cover is ridiculous, especially in a year where you have young people in Hong Kong fighting for freedom. And then you put this girl who was in a million dollar sailing yacht going across the ocean to the U.N. as a person of the year. It's just it shows that the media is sort of disconnected from history in a really serious way. But again, I mean, David, you know, you've worked at, at some major media outlets that have, you know, actual liberals working at them. What is your what is your take on the people that put her on this platform? I mean, I remember during the U.N. summit or whatever it was, you know, she was on you know, CNN was running story after story about her, all these different major outlets, Times, The Post. Are, are, what, are, what are they thinking? I mean, I really mean this. What what is wrong with these adults? I don't know. I mean, I think they're siloed, you know, and with people who think just like them, they don't really, they're not critical, they, they tend not to be critical thinkers. And I think that's something we all suffer to, with, with some extent, we need to look at the things that we believe in, and, and give them a good, thorough, you know, intellectual, you know, look. But I don't think that that happens at all in these institutions. And I think then they just see conservatives as evil people or dumb people and anything they believe Conservatives, you know, liberals quickly just reflexively, perfunctorily push back against and think it's stupid. So that to them, this this because they believe in this climate apocalyptic climate change theory, as if it were a religion. To them, this is Joan of Arc, basically. Yeah, Greta must work on her anger management problem, then go to a good old fashioned movie with a friend. Chill, Greta, chill is what Trump tweeted out this morning. Yeah, let me quickly say, I don't like teenagers yelling at me and telling me what to do. I don't either. That's smart. So I'm not mocking her for her, her, her problems or anything like that, but she is, has no basis to tell me how to live my life. She doesn't know anything. She's, you know, I'm sorry to say, a high school dropout whose parents let her uh, play act saint. I, I have zero interest in listening to what she has to say. Yeah, I've been saying this too. It does remind me, it's, it's almost like some of the uh, some of the re- religious groups and and some of the societies where they re- where they revere you know a, a child as god king because you know that's how the dynasty works but that's what this is I mean this is the elevation of a of as you said a, a not even finished high school kid into some kind of global prophet it's ab- it's it's just it's on its face it's completely absurd um, can you t- tell me what David what happened here with this uh, executive order and there's all this pushback on Trump signing an executive order meant to protect the Jewish community. 
I haven't dug into this that much, but I've been seeing some chatter. What can you tell us? Well, initially, he, it was reported by the New York Times incorrectly. It turns out that he was going to sign this uh, order protecting college kids from anti-Semitic uh, movements and things like that. It's kind so of BDS. But, yeah, so the BDS, but in general, it would have re-categorized um, Judaism as a nationality. Now, this, of course, upset a lot of people, especially Israel haters who, who don't want to think of Judaism in that way. And uh, But it was wrong to begin with. That was just a language from the Obama era that was used as a way, because religion, I think, is not part of uh, title, whatever it is, in colleges. So, you know, they use that kind of language just to make, so they can put Judaism under protection. It isn't like anything major. But, of course, people start freaking out and actually comparing uh, Trump to Hitler and Stalin because those people also had uh, categorized Judaism as, as nation, as a nation, which is actually wrong, and especially Hitler's case, it was more of a ra- racial thing, but just nonsense and ridiculous uh, pushback to Trump, who has been an immense friend to the Jewish people, in my opinion, for all the bad things that I think he might have done. That is the great, one of the greatest things I think he's done, and uh, it was just typical, you know, just... If Trump does it, it must be bad. Like, they have to find a way to make it bad. Yeah, I mean, everything he does, he may put, brings, you know, makes Jerusalem the embassy, brings the embassy to Jerusalem, and everyone shouts about how that is actually anti-Semitic because more people are going to be mad at Jews. I mean, imagine living your life like that. It's just, it's not a, it's not a way that we would talk about any other people. But when it comes to Trump, everything he does is bad. It's just, it's really kind of corrosive to any kind of debate or, you know, or, or discussion or reporting. Everything. Is this the craziest it's ever been, David? Frustrating. In your life? Is this Frustrating. the craziest it's ever been? So, yes, I think obviously it's the crazy. I once wrote a column about how if you had told me when I was 15 that Donald Trump would be president and you know uh, Bill Cosby would be in prison for rape and uh, you know OJ was a murderer, I would not believe you. Um, but but as far as politics goes, it's just it's just absolutely nuts. Some days I'm like, this is the best. This is so entertaining. And some days I'm like, I can't believe this is, <laughs> See? you know, this is the nation. This is that, the That's nation. the way I feel about it. I'm like, what a time to be alive. And especially a time to be writing about and working in politics. Like we have, this is the most entertaining president in the history of the United States, in the history of the world. I mean, there's no one else who even comes close. See, when he became president, I'm like, oh, this, he's a nut and this is going to be crazy. But then what he did was he showed us in, in I'm not saying he's not a nut. But he showed us that everyone else are also they're all nuts as well. Like you know, when I see someone like Adam Schiff running running government, I'm like, oh my God, we are sc-. you know we, th- th- these people are not serious. They're no more serious than Donald Trump. They just act in a way, you know, they act. Put yeah, on they, they put on airs, but they're all they're all clowns. It's absolutely true. Everybody, David Harsanyi, check out his latest at National Review. dot com. He's got a piece there about how the Pfizer abuse is a massive scandal. David does great work. David, thanks so much for joining us, my friend. We'll talk soon. Anytime. Thank you. The Crossfire Hurricane team obtained information from Steele's primary subsource in January 2017 that raised significant questions about the reliability of the Steele reporting. This was particularly noteworthy because the FISA applications relied entirely on information from the Steele from the steel, I'm sorry, from the primary subsources reporting to support the allegation that Page was coordinating with the Russian government on 2016 U.S. presidential election activities. However, the FBI did not share this information with department lawyers, and it was therefore omitted from the last two renewal applications. Let me unpack this for a second. And we mentioned this with David before, but these are just these are important things. And look, I want you to be able to listen to this show and know every point you need to know so that when some lib comes up to you and says, the dossier might be kind of true, you're like, actually, one, two, three, Freedom Hut represent, checkmate, you're donezo. So that's one of my goals here is that you listen to this show and you'll know everything you need to know so that not only you're aware of the truth, but also if you come up against somebody who still believes in the lies uh, and still believes the dossier, for example, was founded in anything other than uh, fantasy, opposition research, and disinformation, or as the Russians call it, um, disinformatia. Disinformatia. It's fun to do like the disinformatia. 
that would be a great name of like a really ironic Williamsburg band, you know, the Disinformatia. I think that would kind of be cool. Uh, anyway, the Pfizer situation here gets even sketchier because what he's telling you is that there's the Steele dossier, right? This guy Steele paid by the DNC, by Hillary's DNC, by her campaign, paid to pull together this stuff on Trump. This guy who says that he felt an urgent need to stop Trump from being president of the United States. He goes around, he talks to a bunch of people. He's got these sources. It's just gossip. It's There's no verification. There's nothing. He's just, yeah, I know people. I know some Russian dudes, some Ukrainian dudes, whatever. We'll talk to them. And after they had gotten the FISA opened up on Carter Page, they go for renewal and it comes up that guess what? One of, and this is where it's a little bit, there's a little bit of a dodge that liberals will use here, a little bit of a, of a game that it's not they found that the dossier itself in this way was entirely refuted, although it is refuted, but that there was a subsource, a primary subsource of the dossier. So one of the main people giving information for the dossier told them in January of 2017, yeah, um, the dossier is probably all, all crap. The dossier is probably not something that uh, you guys should rely on. And they left that out to get a fight to get Pfizer renewals that's not that's not the kind of neglect you can explain by people being dumb or ignorant or lazy that's intentional that was done for a reason and it also goes to the entirety of the dossier was a lie I mean there what you have here is an investigation built on lies and then perpetuated with more lies and now they tell us well because everybody was too stupid to know any of those lies were lies when they happened, there's really not a huge problem here. No, it's an enormous problem. I don't think the for right-thinking people, for intelligent human beings in this country, I don't think the reputation of the FBI... Theo, you ask for a miracle, I give you the FBI. The greatest Christmas movie of all time. Bar none. Bar none. Don't don't give me your Christmas story and your miracle on miracle on, you know, 33rd Street or whatever. You know, no. Sorry. We all know what the greatest Christmas movie of all time is. Um, come out to the coast, have a few laughs. You remember. You guys all know. I'm going to watch it this year. I'm going to watch it probably with my brothers. This is what we should do on Christmas Day. Have a viewing of Die Hard. So, uh, the dossier was... A central source for the dossier proved that the dossier was crap. Essentially, another way of saying the dossier was crap. And by the way, they hid that from the FISA court. So I think that that's an important part of all this for you to know. But now I got to move now because I know we've we've gotten uh, deep on this stuff. But this is now forward looking. This is where all of this is going because it's not over yet. It's not over yet. Libs, sorry. We're not done with you. Because this. Attorney General understands exactly what the liberals have tried to do here, what the libs have been up to. He knows. And he is the single greatest threat to the Democratic establishment right now, other than Donald Trump himself, Attorney General Barr. They're going to come at him with everything they have because he also has one of the finest prosecutors. And they've all, everyone has known this for a long time. Durham is a fair prosecutor. There has been no, there was no deviation from that until, oh, wait a second, he's been appointed to look at the origins of the entire Russia collusion uh, conspiracy? Oh, no, we, we don't know if we can trust this guy. Oh, no, he's a partisan tool now. This is what they're going to be saying. They're going to have to undermine Barr and Durham. Durham will be a little tougher because he doesn't really play politics. They've already objected, though, to the statement from Durham's office. They've said, oh, something must have happened. Now, all of a sudden, Durham isn't the ethical fellow that everybody has known him to be for all of those years. Something must have happened. Something must have changed. You have uh, Dick Durbin, for example, going after Attorney General. Producer Brandon, can you please play uh, clip 11 at your convenience? This uh, Attorney General, William P. Barr, has become a partisan tool of this administration. When he aspired to this office, he told all of us face to face, I want to stand up for the integrity of the Department of Justice. I want to make sure we have someone there who is going to stand up for the rule of law. And look what we have now. 
He is critical of an inspector general, widely respected. He is critical of the FBI, for goodness sakes, an investigative agency that his department depends on. And he's pursuing these wild-eyed conspiracy theories, traveling to Italy and other places with Mr. Durham. I mean, I'm afraid uh, Mr. Barr's credibility is zero at this point. Nice try, Durbin. We know exactly what you're trying to pull here. I know what you're trying to do, and I don't like it. Critical of the FBI. The FBI is critical of the FBI, Durbin, you imbecile. The FBI has completely and utterly beclowned itself. Of course the Attorney General... It would be insane if the Attorney General was not critical of them. But he's now saying that that undermines his credibility? No one in the FBI is standing up saying, hey, you know, we did a great job. Give us a, give us a trophy. There are, the people involved in this, not only should they be hanging their heads in shame, they might be in some trouble. You've got to see as they dig into what, their, what, what, what are their professional lapses all about. How do they come to this point? But also notice how Durbin calls the attorney general's meetings abroad a conspiracy. How does Durbin know that? You know what Durbin knows about the attorney general traveling overseas? Nothing. But he's already he's already laying the groundwork. This is propaganda. This is this is straight up malicious PR, right? These are the tactics of the demagogue. Get ahead. You don't know what's going on, and you don't know what the results are. But you know that they're not they're not going to be good for your side because we've seen everything so far shows us that. So you got to get ahead of it and say these are bad guys, bad people. Don't listen to them. You can't listen to them. And as part of that effort, you have, and I gotta love this. You have Eric Holder, who has written an editorial in the Washington Post about how just sad he is that Attorney General Barr is no longer somebody that uh, can be trusted in this way. No longer is somebody that uh, we can look to to tell us the truth. This is astonishing. But you have Attorney General Holder attacking him in this in this op-ed and William Barr is unfit to be Attorney General that is what he has written here now I just before I get into the laughable nature of the charges or the allegations or whatever you want to call them against Attorney General Barr I just want to say that it's it's a it's a rich thing for Eric Holder to be the guy who is making this allegation, considering that Eric Holder famously described himself as President Obama's wingman, that Eric Holder famously was the guy who presided over a federal law enforcement operation that pushed weapons through straw purchasers into the hands of Mexican drug cartels, probably so that they could engage in some, you know, sweeping gun reform and saying, oh, look, the, the cartels, it's all our fault, all the violence there. So they push gun uh, dealers to sell to straw purchasers. This was Operation Fast and Furious back in, what, 2011, 2012? They, they push them to do this, and then one of those weapons ends up being used to murder Border Patrol agent Brian Terry. About 100 people were killed by guns directly. I mean, the serial numbers tied to that operation. Eric Holder held in contempt of Congress for not being willing to even discuss anything about it. Just, you know, whatever. Trying to, trying to be uh, clever about ways to undermine the Second Amendment. And uh, this is where it is, my friends. This is, this is what we are now dealing with. And then also there's that little problem of Attorney General Holder at the time being a just a senior Department of Justice employee, but the one directly involved in getting Mark Rich under the in the very last days of the Clinton administration. Mark Rich had absconded from the United States. He was a billionaire financier, and he never faced justice. He fled. And he was pardoned in absentia by Bill Clinton. The guy was doing illegal oil deals with Iran. It was under sanctions. He was doing tax evasion. I mean, the guy was a crook. He was pardoned in absentia by Bill Clinton, and Eric Holder got the signatures, got it done. 
And you know why? Because Mark Rich's ex- ex-wife is a big Democrat donor. It's just it was just a just a pay to play or a pay to pardon. Might as well just sell the pardon to the highest bidder. You know, ne- I mean, there's so much that was wrong with this, but you don't pardon somebody that's fled the country and never faced justice at all for crimes they clearly committed that are still crimes. It's not like he fled the country as some kind of a, I know, uh, for a conscience crime. He wasn't a conscientious objector or something. That that's Eric Holder for you. Eric Holder's the guy who thought that that wasn't such a big deal. You know, he's admitted since, you know, maybe that maybe that was kind of bad. Yeah, you don't say. Eric Holder's Justice Department also refused to prosecute a member of the new Black Panther Party who was standing at a polling place, threatening people, holding a baton, and dressed in the uniform of the new Black Panther Party, didn't want to prosecute him under civil rights violations, under intimidation at a polling place, because, you know, just didn't want to. Yeah. That, that uh, Attorney General Eric Holder, and he's now coming out and, and criticizing Attorney General Barr. Uh, Attorney General Barr is ten times the lawyer Eric Holder ever was. And that goes without saying. Or I guess I just said it, so it goes with saying. Um, Attorney General Barr was already the Attorney General of the George H.W. Bush administration. No complaints about him being a, you know, a, a hack right-wing apologist or anything. No, no none of that considered a very competent, very solid attorney general then, was in the Office of Legal Counsel in the DOJ, and is a lawyer's lawyer. I mean, is a guy that anybody who's worked in the higher echelons of DC, of the D.C. and New York legal profession knows, this guy's the real deal. And the libs are just going to lie and lie and lie about him. Eric Holder's writing this, unf- he's unfit to be attorney general, he says, of, of Barr. I mean, what a disgrace. All the, the people that were working the Obama administration, I mean, they were all, they were o- Obama loyalists, no matter, no matter what the situation, no matter what the cause that we're talking about. Um, but they have to treat Barr like Kavanaugh because they know that Barr is a threat to them. And so, or, and they will choose to treat him like Kavanaugh, as in they will do everything they can to destroy him. They will do everything they can to ruin his reputation, to intimidate him. You know, they think it's probably like John Roberts or, you know, you run enough mean editorials about John Roberts in the Supreme Court, all of a sudden he starts agreeing with liberals. You know, kind of kind of wants the heat off him a little bit, you know, eh, and can justify it by saying we've got to protect the institution of the Supreme Court. I mean, you know, Roberts is iffy on his constitutional responsibilities and interpretation. A lot of it people believe it's because of the pressure that's brought to bear. They're trying to bring pressure against Barr. The good thing is Barr's like, bring it on, because he knows. He knows. My friends, all it's going to take is one email, one one piece of evidence to show that Brennan or Clapper or Comey or one of these deep state actors took what was a conspiracy peddled by the Hillary Clinton campaign against Trump and decided to run with it. And this whole thing, the whole thing unravels. Now, will they ever admit that they were wrong? No, of course not. They'll pull a Comey. This guy doesn't matter how many facts come out to show that he's a liar, that he's unethical, that he's a scummy, scummy individual. Never admit that he was wrong. But that doesn't mean that we won't have proof that he was wrong. And Barr and Durham are going to get that and then some in this investigation. I told you that there don't expect there to be fireworks. Don't expect, you know, there to be, quote, heads rolling, so to speak, over the IG report that the bureaucracy would always kind of protect itself. Benefit of the doubt goes to the employees. The uh, AG report that you're going to see with Durham, that's going to be the one where Democrats really just need to hang their heads in shame for it. For, well, they won't, though, because they have no shame. But they should. As we gather this afternoon, our thoughts turn to the grieving families in New Jersey. Yesterday, two wicked murderers opened fire at a kosher supermarket and killed four innocent souls, including a brave police officer who faced down the shooter and very bravely faced the shooter down. With one heart, America weeps for the lives lost. With one voice, we vow to crush the monstrous evil of anti-Semitism whenever and wherever it appears. And we're working very hard on that. And I can tell you that 
that we have a lot of people in government working very, very hard on that, and we appreciate their work. It's not easy. As David Harsani was saying before, the president is uh, a friend to Jewish Americans and also a friend to uh, our ally Israel. Um, I would just note that this terrible attack, this anti-Semitic attack, as we know now, by two members of the uh, the black Israelites, whatever that ideology, whatever, we, however we, religion, I guess, it's a religion. Um, interestingly enough, Rashida Tlaib had to delete a tweet right after that shooting because uh, guess what she thought? She tweeted that uh, the attack in Jersey City was the result of white supremacy initially. 